we have global ambitions at Coho, but we have a very clear path on dominating the Canadian market and significantly participating in the U.S. market as well. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. We're here with none other than Andrew Barnes. You may have seen him at Deal Night. We're talking about an industry that's relevant to all of us now. It's going to get a lot more relevant in the future, yet a lot of you probably don't even know about it. So what we're going to talk about is called Ghost Kitchens, aka Virtual Kitchens, aka Cloud Kitchens. Um, and Andrew is certainly an expert in this space. So we're going to dive into his company, Coho, which trades on the in Canada on the exchange, uh, on the Toronto exchange uh, under the ticker Coho.v. Andrew, thank you so much for coming to share some knowledge with us. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you for the opportunity. I'm always excited about talking about our business. And I guess not everybody will have seen our deal night, uh, the, the videos we put together. So in case somebody has no idea what ghost kitchen, virtual kitchen, or cloud kitchen even means, would you mind just giving us a little bit of a walkthrough, A, about what is that, what is this industry, and B, tell us a little bit about Coho and uh, what you guys are doing? Absolutely. Uh, you nailed it. This is an emerging industry and we're sitting right on the edge of it. Um, Coho Collective is Canada's leading company in shared kitchens. We provide a platform for small and medium businesses to thrive, um, offering kitchens as a service. Um, we also offer business support and logistical support to our members. Uh, we started Coho over four years ago and we were successful from the beginning, quickly filling our kitchens and meeting an overwhelming demand of the locations that we had. In the last three years, as you're talking about, a whole new industry has opened up. So we opened up in the shared, large shared kitchen environments where many different types of food businesses can operate from um, food trucks to caterers to meal kit companies and all, all other manners of business. But Ghost Kitchens, as you uh, alluded to there, is a brand new thing. And what that is is a delivery, de sorry, a delivery only restaurant, uh, meaning that if you are sat at home on the couch uh, after a long, hard day of work and ordering on Uber Eats or skip the dishes, um, that food that you're uh, ordering from some of your favorite restaurants might be coming from our facilities, still produced by their same talented chef groups, but operating in a facility that is better located to your house and uh, is a more economical way for restaurants to meet the growing demands of their customers. Um, this is a emerging need that uh, most restaurant groups are looking at how to continue to grow in a time where uh, it's risky potentially to do so. Those kitchens, however, only represent about 20% of our businesses operating in our kitchens. So while it's this big emerging new need, uh, the need for shared kitchen facilities, meaning that you can get in there, start your business quickly, um, has has been an emerging need for a long time in cities that are really under pressured with real estate. And you can imagine the time for permitting and the challenges that uh, surround that for every type of food business. So while Ghost Kitchens is a huge opportunity for us to capture, uh, the whole food business is really uh, our customer base. So what I'm curious about, and tell me if I'm on the right track here, when I was in New York, I went through a big facility. It used to be a Pfizer building. Each floor was just a bunch of different kitchens dedicated to different companies. One was just making, I think, cookies. One was like tortilla shells. Uh, then there was one that was full meal kits. Tell me if I have the right idea about a shared kitchen here. So it's like, let's say I want to start a certain product line making, you know, Kev's burrito bowls, <laughs> or whatever. And I don't want to get a whole new kitchen facility of my own. So instead, maybe I lease a certain amount of, I guess, hours in somebody else's facility and maybe other companies do the same. Is that what a shared kitchen is? Yeah, you, you got it. Um, so uh, take co-working in the tech world as kind of the closest and an analogous thing uh, where you're renting time at a desk. Instead, you're renting time in a kitchen. Uh, so enter our facilities and you have to have all the proper authority, uh, sorry, and approvals to do so. But as soon as you get going, uh, you can start producing that food without all the upfront uh, time, cost, um, and challenges, to be honest, to get up and going. Uh, so within our locations, we offer a couple different models. One might be a, a totally communal environment. So you can imagine a very long cooking line and then just a bunch of prep pods and people come to the cooking line and they share and it's a, uh, an exciting kind of uh, uh, spectacle to watch um, the orchestra of, um, of work that happens within those facilities. We also have facilities that are more based for larger businesses that are private facilities. So imagine going into a big warehouse and instead of having um, one large open shared working space that we've subdivided at about 15 different times for 
like those brands you were talking about, they're potentially a larger brand that can operate, that can do so within their own space, but they can also get up and going uh, within only a couple of weeks without that challenge. So just to give you an idea, our um, our newest location uh, that opened in East Vancouver, um, we have a 10,000 square foot location. We have 50 square feet of, um, or 50 uh, foot long cooking line and we have over 40 companies that are operating in and out of that space um, so a huge amount of um, kind of economic activity happening out of one very small location uh, and having a huge impact not only those businesses that are operating but the community that are closely surrounds it yeah no kidding so when I like I use <laughs> I'm a shameless user of Uber Eats and skip the dishes like probably far more than I should and when we were at deal night you surveyed the whole crowd uh, to get people to put up their hands if they've ordered in the last week, last two days, last hour. I had my hand up for the whole thing, and, I, and as did most of the crowd. So when I look at these apps, though, something that I found interesting that you shared with me, so I'm flipping through some of the different restaurants on there. One that pops up, it was Mr. Mr. Beast's Burger, and it's this honestly nasty-looking burger, but you know, if, if you don't know who Mr. Beast is and you're watching this, he's a, a massively famous YouTuber. And right away, I was like, okay, there's no way Mr. Beast is opening up restaurants for his single, like for his burger in every city. So I'm like, okay, that's a perfect example of a ghost kitchen. So let's just say theoretically, I'm a restaurant entrepreneur and I want to open up a restaurant in Vancouver. And I have the choice of doing a retail location downtown or a ghost kitchen and delivery only. Could we like try to do a bit of a side by side about some of the pros and cons of like each, you know, each method, you know, in terms of timing to onboard? cost obviously can you kind of walk us through what that might look like uh, absolutely so the there's two really big groups to start with that are looking to enter our space it's uh, it's restaurant groups that are looking to go faster um, and to uh, expand their delivery network and then there's people that are first-time entrepreneurs and those first-time entrepreneurs don't have very much time very much money and very much experience in opening new facilities we are able to cater to both of those um, those environments. Generally, the biggest kind of cost that you're dealing with is speed to market. So the the biggest challenge in entering any new market, whether that's Mr. Beast arriving to Vancouver or a brand that's building and growing their business here, um, if you're sitting on waiting on opening a physical location, you're going to be sitting and waiting for a long time. So just to go through a few of those things. Number one, in any jurisdiction you're going to go into, you're looking at permitting. Um, so not a super sexy, glorious thing to talk about, but permitting can take anywhere from six months to a year to get approval to open up a facility uh, to get going. If you find a turnkey restaurant operation, you can move faster than that. But then you have the next thing, which is the actual build out and any of those capital costs that have to go out. So there's not many people that would take a restaurant and just turn it around and flip it out overnight. So you have build time on top of that. So you're looking at six to months of the permitting time and then another six months of a, of a build out time if you're doing well. And at that point, you then sat on a new bricks and mortar facilities for a year, likely plan paying rent for the majority of that period. Um, and you're already in the hole. Then you're looking at the actual delays and the build out cost of the equipment itself. So, um, the restaurant industry has been hit just as hard, or the food uh, the food um, equipment industry has been hit just as hard as everywhere else. The supply chains are brutal, uh, and you're looking at waiting on delays. We just waited six months uh, on a delay for cooler panel walls to arrive, uh, and that would be in another time that you would have to add on and an additional cost that you're dealing with. Uh, so really, you're looking at probably minimum of a year of a time to open up your facility. Depending on the scope of what you're opening, you're looking at hundreds of thousands, but more likely millions of dollars to open restaurants. If you go to your, your big glitzy restaurant downtown, you don't even want to know how much they're building uh, those locations out, but it can go north of $10 million very quickly. Um, and uh, of course, that's not a service that we're offering, but the ability to get out there, hit that cost to market. So whether you want that Mr. Beast Burger sitting at home on your couch, um, do you need it coming from a $10 million facility or can come from our facility? Now, the difference of operating in our facility for these businesses is that you can get going within two weeks. Um, wow. And why I say two weeks is that's the, the long end, because really what you need to operate into our facility is you need an agreement with us, of course, um, insurance paperwork to make sure that we're all protected and safe. Uh, and then you need uh, approval from our health authority. And they're the longest part of that process, but that is a two-week process because we have such a great relationship with our health authorities. The places are 
uh, smooth, efficient, uh, clean, um, that the health authority wants these companies to get in there and operating quickly because the alternative is is not as good. Sure. Um, even amongst our health authority, for example, imagine a one health authority inspector going and checking 40 different businesses or coming to one location and being able to hold people in adherence of the, the guidelines. So it's really night and day. It's yeah, you're kidding. at a year, millions of dollars to two weeks, thousands of dollars. And the, really the thousands of dollars is like getting your cost of goods going and things like that. So it, the real thing that it saves, even if you have all the money at the end of the day and all the time to, to design your thing, uh, it's the opportunity cost. And that's what we look at every single part of the business. The biggest opportunity that we can provide our members, which is what we call our customers, is cutting out all the noise. Just focus on making amazing food, finding new customers, marketing your product. You do that, we'll take care of everything else. We'll take care of the build. The cooler goes down. We get a heat dome and we have to figure out three new techs to make sure that we're never going to have an issue with our cold storage. We take care of all of that problem um, so that all you really have to do. And that's one of the things that we often get reported from people that graduate our spaces, get their own restaurants. They're like, holy, I didn't realize on how much you were taken care of so that we could focus on the business. And that comes from a, uh, an opportunity cost, but a pure financial cost as well that we're able to, to uh, provide to our members. So that makes sense. And I mean, I, I knew it was cheaper and quicker. I just didn't realize the magnitude of it. Um, that kind of makes it, I guess it answers part of my next question as to your, your wait list is huge. Uh, tell me if I'm right here, you have a hundred members actively right now, but another 400 in the in the wait list like actively on a wait list is that true is that correct yeah i, I think when i sent you the stat yes that was true yeah. um our clients now as we have new locations which i'll talk about in a little while coming online our clients are increasing quickly um and the wait list is increasing quickly as well <laughs> 400 wow. companies wait list currently represents the local vancouver area um, oh, oh that's added- just vancouver that's just Vancouver. So oh, when you add on our other locations, but also we've started to do a little bit of um, market analysis in the in our future locations, uh, there this is a huge need and demand. And just as a as a reminder, like twenty percent of that is ghost kitchens. The rest are all sorts of different food businesses within our facilities. Not one company shut down over wow. a twelve month period um, because they were able to pivot. They went from being a caterer that was serving to movie sets that were now closed to doing uh, home meal delivery. And because we had seven or eight different segments within our facility, um, we people just pivoted and helped each other out. Um, I wouldn't say thrive during that time, but survived and were able to uh, kind of build a nice platform to grow from. You know, one one comment I get from from people that are curious is that they're thinking, okay, as soon as you know we're able to go out and about, everybody's back to restaurants, nobody's ordering from delivery apps again. Being the the first kind of concern, the second being the you know the recession word, everyone's kind of nervous of that. Does that impact? So I'm just kind of curious from what you've seen firsthand, how has that change in demand looked uh, in the last you know whatever six months or so? Yeah, it's a common question that we get asked is, first of all, what what impact business? And the answer is always a reluctant answer of it was very positive for us. We know that we were very fortuitous to be in a segment that's a, uh, the, that benefited from it. And I know that a lot of people didn't. Um, we, it really accelerated our business. Uh, the second question is the fear of, is it pu- purely propped up uh, because of that uh, opportunity? And we're very glad to say on the other end of it, that's also uh, hasn't proven out. Um, what we really think that we've kind of stumbled into is a re- recession resistant industry. Mm-hmm. And the reason that I I say that is that uh, with you hear all the stories, there's a significant added pressure in running any business. Restaurant businesses, I think, are probably hit one of the hardest. Um, so added pressure on costs. Like we found out recently that deep fryer oil was going up 250 percent this year alone. Um, imagine like a deep fryer heavy business, what that could do to their their business. Um, the staffing, we've all heard the stories that there's there's no staff anymore. Uh, and the ability to do this, uh, to, to do look at your business differently and run those things differently. Um, risks of signing long-term leases. Uh, a lot of restaurateurs don't want to take those mm-hmm. risks that they might have been okay with beforehand. Um, access to capital, like a lot of people's um, credits were significantly impacted during this time, especially over-indexed in the the retail industry and the hospitality industry. So the ability to get those leases and get those loans is harder and harder. So the ability to move into our facilities is is higher. <laughs> so we benefit from kind of some of that instability. And just like you see in any kind of 
recession around the world, that's where entrepreneurship really flow, um, like uh, grows, blossoms, and we're thankful to see the activity that operates within that space itself. And then going back just to that, that fragmented nature of the different companies operating in our space, excuse me, um, it is, it's just a further risk kind of mitigation to that business itself. So the last thing to say there is that if any of you guys have been into restaurants lately, they're busier than ever. It's hard to get reservations again. Um, however, uh, everybody's also reporting that online sales have not dipped at all. So they were already kind of on the rise in uh, pre all of these uh, third party delivery apps were already growing at a hockey stick growth and then really took that off. And it hasn't slowed down. Like I imagine that the growth rate specifically has slowed down, but the actual performance of it has not slowed down. So you have all these restaurants that built up really great online programs that now have to deliver that while also delivering their full service uh, restaurants. So they're looking for ways to get the delivery drivers out of their restaurants so that they can focus on offering that premium experience, um, but also uh, in order to continue to sell to both segments that they have. Um, so... It's it's basically what we often talk about is that we've sat at this great position where we had a successful business. We were meeting this uh, great community demand and then an entire new industry opened up underneath us. Um, and we've been sprinting to try to capture and make sure that we stay on the front of. Um, but it's changing every single day and it's an exciting place to be. Yeah. And, and I'm not surprised that the, there's a permanent level of behavior change because thinking about uh, ordering groceries online, ordering stuff off Amazon instead of going to the mall or whatever, and then ordering food online. I know like a, a chunk of people who were pretty hesitant to do any of this stuff. And there's like that initial friction of like them to figure it out and start doing it. And then I can, be, even with like my mom, for example, like being a, a total laggard on this, once I set her up and got her started using it, she's like, oh, I can just like click these buttons and something shows up at my door and I don't have to get in my car. And they're like, oh, I get it. And I'm like, I told you. So I'm like, I'm really not surprised at all that once you get used to that convenience, um, it's hard to go back. Um, yeah, and I, got, and I come from, oh, sorry, I was going to say like, the, the other thing is that e-commerce in Canada tracks, lags way behind the United States. Oh, I didn't so know a lot of the growth that we've seen is even higher than the growth rates that they saw in the States because people are catching up, like hmm. whether it's your mom or whether it's myself of, of figuring out and being more comfortable with those types of purchases. The other piece is that technology is also way behind in the tech industry specifically, hmm. sorry, in the food industry specifically. Um, so uh, people looking for and searching for tech solutions to making their lives easier, uh, all kinds of fell at the same place and again has benefited us mm -hmm. and i do want to talk about the tech side of things but but first something you you mentioned about how you're you're running to keep up um i previously mentioned that you have 400 people on the wait list or had i guess you alluded to it being continuing to grow maybe let's talk a little bit about growth and i'm i'm not trying to pry you for for inside information or anything so i know you have to be careful with it but i, I would love to get a little bit of color on what does growth look like? You know, you said this demand is primarily Vancouver. I know you have a presence on the Sunshine Coast. You announced something in Victoria. In terms of expansion, like one, what, what are your, do you have any kind of East Coast uh, expansion plans? Is it something generally in the horizon? Um, can you share anything about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll first talk about the growth that we've seen since the IPO. So we, uh, at the IPO, we had three, uh, which is this uh, June 7th, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, is when we had a big influx of, of money and allowed us to get closure on a lot of the projects that were near complete. Um, so by the end of October, we will have gone from three locations to eight locations in that period. Um, so more than doubling our um, amount of locations and the facilities that we have to operate. Um, we haven't released the projections against uh, Thanks, So thank you for giving me a little bit of, of grace on that. But Within the IPO deck itself, uh, I believe we projected that we were reaching 4.6 million of revenue by um, March 2023. Um, we have no updates against that other than we believe that we have that aggressive growth plan and I'm confident in our ability to hit it. Um, 
while I can't discuss new locations coming up, you can imagine that if we're opening five locations in a three month period, uh, that we also have uh, big plans beyond that as well. Uh, we are already uh, the dominant shared kitchen company in Canada operating in BC only, uh, and we have huge opportunity. Uh, we have, we're gonna have eight operating locations that we have zero issues and concerns with filling. Um, in a city that's eight times smaller than Toronto. So that's where, our, of course, our focus, I'm not hiding anything, that is our East Coast Canada is a huge opportunity for us and uh, opening those locations as soon as we can is, is something that keeps us up at night to make sure that we um, meet the needs of our members that are out there that are looking for facilities. Because of course, 400 companies on the wait list represents, I, I believe, $6 million of annual revenue. Okay. Amazing, great for the company, great for the investor. But that's also 400 companies that are not in the best situations. Maybe they're operating out of restaurants and squeezing more than they would like to. Maybe they're sharing space with another food producer and not able to grow. So there's a significant impediment for growth of those companies that are on the wait list themselves that want to make sure that we, at the end of the day, at the end of, if our members succeed, we'll succeed. So if we can find all of those companies, good places to grow, and then there's going to be thousands that are behind the, them <laughs> waiting to find uh, better ways to grow their business. And just for the sake of uh, giving some context, like if you say, you know, eight locations, I'm just wondering if somebody at home is thinking a location is like the size of a restaurant. Um, you know, it's just not. So like, let's talk about your Richmond location. You made that announcement. It's one of the largest facilities of its kind in Canada. How big is it? Like, can you give us some sense of scale? Uh yeah, so uh, we have three different models. Uh, we do micro locations, which are around two to 3,000 square feet. Um, those we need to build like two or three in a specific location to make sure that the economies of scale work. But those ones are nice because you can find some nice turnkey situations, whether they be defunct restaurants or um, uh, catering groups, things that people that are able to start but not able to grow within those spaces. They make sense for us and they allow us to move faster. The second model is roughly around a 10,000 square foot location. Those are the locations that we've typically been building out so far, um, eight to 10,000 square feet. You can support about 30 to 40 members within those uh, spaces itself. Um, and uh, those locations are the ones that we have going, uh, the strong uh, EBITDA profit on each of those ones that are operating. So we, we've got those dialed in on. Our next step is that we just keep running out of space. Like our main challenge is that more members want to start and the members that are within the space. So the reason that our wait list stays kind of consistent is because whenever we do get somebody that leaves, whether they go on to their own business, shut their business down or whatever, um, rather than being able to pull from the wait list, the guy that's already sat there next to them asks for additional space, additional really? service. Um, so finding additional space is, um, it continues to be a, a, a main need. So just to bury the lead, Richmond is a 27,000 square foot 27, location. 27,000. Okay. Seven. So huge. <laughs> so more than three, um, well, more than two times, uh, bigger than any of our other locations. The really exciting thing there is that we're partnering with the developer to do this. So a developer, uh, in Vancouver, a really highly respected, um, group called the Peterson group, uh, are helping to build this place with us. Um, um, and the reason that we're doing this is that we're really trying to uh, change up. It's opening in Richmond, in, in North Richmond, and there's not a huge um, food kind of hub in that location. It's an amazing food city, uh, and this is like a little desert within it. Uh, so we're trying to um, kind of renovate that area, provide food services to our developers, um, uh, other businesses, um, but offering over like tens of thousands of square feet for small businesses to succeed hmm. in. Very cool. So in, in terms of like, okay, so you, you have this growing wait list. So it, you know, it sounds, okay, you onboard, that equals additional revenue. Can you talk us through like, what does it take to onboard clients? Like what are your biggest, I mean, I imagine the bottleneck is, is finding real estate, either what, buying or building it fast enough at an economical price. Like, is that the main bottleneck that, that would slow you down from just onboarding these clients lickety split? Yes. Yeah. The biggest bottleneck is opening fast enough. It's the physical build or the retrofit of that build. Mm -hmm. We have found a couple turnkey situations that are able to open within a couple months. Um, those are few and far between and not only because there's just not a lot of access to food spaces. As soon as a food facility comes up, it usually gets snapped up by somebody pretty quickly. Um, okay. If anybody has heard like the industrial or light industrial um, uh, availability capacity on the market is lower than it's ever been before. So these things will wrap up quickly, but also 
going into a facility that doesn't work. We've not only seen it ourselves with a previous location, um, but um, competitors that we have, have been meeting with uh, have all run into the same issues where if you try to retrofit a location, or sorry, if you don't successfully retrofit an old functioning location, um, you're not going to be able to meet the the financial targets that you're hoping for, and you're not going to give the support to the members that you're wanting. Um, so yes, our main focus is making sure that we find turnkey facilities so we can open up faster, uh, have enough projects in the pipeline for these larger build outs that um, will all kind of come online. And as soon as that machine gets start going, and now that we're better funded, that machine can start preparing years in advance, then it should be okay. And then finally through M&A transactions, that's going to be where the, the pure growth comes from because the organic thing just takes time. The reason that it takes years or a year for a restaurant to open, it takes us a year for things to open. Um, and while we're getting better and better at it, there's a certain, there's only a certain amount that we can continue to kind of uh, improve that. So we're going to need to find multiple ways to grow the business while waiting for these larger facilities to come online. So with, with uh, you mentioned a limited supply of light industrial facilities, and I, you know, I know just by reading the news that the price of building and everything is um, been increasing. Has this been like a challenge for you guys to find like like well priced real estate to grow? Like, uh, how have you been managing that? Yeah, we've thankfully been okay. We have a lot of people coming to us. I think that one of the benefits that we have is that we have a slightly higher ability to pay than other people operating operating in these light industrial zones. So most light industrial zones around the world. Um, especially in North America, have turned into kind of cool tech hubs. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and a tech company has an ability to pay per square foot significantly higher than a mechanic shop, for example. Right. Um, so new developers are people trying to like redevelop, for example, Vancouver's Olympic Village or uh, most cities uh, like brewery districts, for example. Um, they're they're seeking and getting or getting higher and higher price per square foot uh, of things. So we kind of sit in the but also is risking their zoning. So developers need a certain amount of industrial clients to operate within their spaces. Uh, so we do a couple of things. One, our ability to pay is slightly higher than a mechanic shop, not as much as a tech company, um, but our ability is somewhere in the in the middle there. And we do check that box of industrial for our our um, uh, for our parties because we're doing proper food production. So we're keeping proper industrial productions in the, the space in the city while also providing, of course, a very close access to the people that are operating in sales. So when you finish cooking, you can immediately get out there to the farmer's market uh, within 15 minutes is, is a significant advantage for us. Um, the other big thing is looking for development partners. Um, these things to your point are not cheap to build out. Uh, however, they are relatively simple. Um, you're talking about going into a warehouse, putting in a lot of plumbing, a lot of power, a lot of equipment. Um, you're not looking at designing and spending hundreds of dollars a square foot on, on the design. Right. It needs to be functional, clean, and easy to maintain. Um, but uh, it's more of all of our dollars. When I look at our build, it's primarily under slab before we even start. So if we can partner with a developer before they've even started the project, which is what we're starting to do, for example, with Richmond, but other projects as well, um, we can bring our price per square foot way down, and that allows us to offer our services for cheaper to our members. Okay, interesting. That's a good point. So, Andrew, your 2021 revenue was 1.8 million, and you previously had estimated 4.6 million by the end of the year, which your fiscal year ends in March. So, my question for you is: Are you still on track? And you know what needs to happen to for you to hit that revenue target? Absolutely. Um, so, there's a certain amount that I can discuss and disclose on these conversations, but what I do want to talk about is that our with the, successful, with the successful closure of our IPO, we unlocked the funds needed to move quickly that we wanted to up until this point and to close off our projects, which is why you see so much organic growth from us right now, from growing from three locations to uh, eight by the end of October. We haven't disclosed our updated targets, but we are confident of achieving anything that we previously talked about. Um, our biggest offer, opportunity for growth has always been and remains the successful closure of uh, M&A transactions. This remains one of the core pieces of our strategy and what the activity of our management team is focused on as well. So while organic growth is continues to be strong, uh, we're also looking to uh, supplement that with uh, helping grow the business through M&A as well. So we've, you know, we've covered a lot of topics. We've talked about, you know, revenue. Uh, we've talked about your expansion, everything. Uh, you know, sometimes I love to just give the question to CEOs. Is there, 
you know, very open-ended question. Is there anything you'd like to say to investors, something that they should understand, anything you want to highlight? Just very open-ended. <laughs> the floor is yours. We went into a lot of detail uh, today, and what I never want to leave on the table is the opportunity that's out there. I live and breathe the detail and talking about price square, square footage um, and, and build costs and all that type of stuff, um, but I don't want to miss the opportunity that's in front of us. Um, we have global ambitions at Coho, but we have a very clear path on dominating the Canadian market and significantly participating in the U.S. market as well. We are proud of our membership. We're really proud of the team that we built and we plan uh, and the plan that we have developed to capture that opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned, this industry didn't exist three years ago, uh, and a whole new industry opened up under a company that was ready to go. Uh, so we're thankful for the investors that have come on um, already. We're thankful for new people that are excited about learning about the business. Um, and yeah, so uh, I think that this is the start of a, of a very, very big story um, and want to make sure that we're all kind of focusing on that growth while also filling up the locations that we have. Awesome. Well, I'm certainly excited as well, and I can't wait to have you back here. So thanks once again for taking the time. I really appreciate having you here. Thank you. Thanks again, Kevin. If you guys watching, just a reminder, that's coho.v, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach us, and we'll be back doing this again soon.